Hey everybody, you came back. I never had a doubt. But if this is the first time we're meeting, I hope you've noticed this film is subtitled Part 2, which means you should follow this link right here and check out my introduction to the Bredora Biosphere Reserve in Part 1, in case you haven't had the chance. I'll stay here. I love telling stories. Some of the first stories were ecologically based, I'd say. Weaving stories based on what you've observed in nature to try to make sense of and explain our place in all of the connections. Because I love science, the Brudeur, and facilitating learning in others, I want to get even more personal than before. A diversity of perspectives and ways of knowing leaves room for many versions of any natural place. Since I'm just one person drawing on the worldviews and resources I have available to me, it wouldn't be fair to speak for everyone. Every ecosystem has a story. The Bredor is no different. Ecology is all about the interactions between many forms of life in a very specific place. A tale of a multitude of interwoven lives that are all going about their business in response to each other and the natural conditions. The existence of many species all competing for space and resources, and largely trying to eat or not get eaten by each other, is what drives evolution and the ecology of a place. Yep. Evolution definitely helps produce the greatest show on Earth. The story of all life started with water, so I think I should too. In Mi'kmaq, this estuary is called Biduba, flowing into oneness. Who wouldn't want to be part of that? In fact, we already are. You see, we have the oceans running through our veins, and those oceans, rivers, and lakes once ran through the veins of earthlings from all over the globe. And all the water that ever will be, already is. Water has been used, recycled, and transported all over the world. It is the sacred source of life, and it requires our respect. The sum total of the water that exists in the Biosphere Reserve is diverse in terms of the habitats it's a part of, the life forms that live in it, and the way that water moves. Yep, our Biosphere Reserve's water have moved out. Just like some teenagers who finally get a chance at independence, they'll come back. This back and forth movement might not be ideal for a human's nest, but it is really important for an estuary ecosystem such as the Bredore Lake. The diversity of water bodies in this ecosystem and the three restrictive marine openings means that once marine water gets in, it's going to be here for a while. You know, I'm kind of pokey too sometimes. This project, for example, it also went through a process of renewal and it took a long time. but I've got nothing on the Bredor. The movement of water in and out of this estuary can be pretty leisurely. There are hundreds of restricted lagoons, ponds, and similar water bodies around the Bredor that can take a long time to exchange their waters with the surrounding ocean. However, we do know that the larger basins such as Wakagama Bay can take up to two years to make a complete exchange with the Atlantic Ocean. Try to think about all the ways life forms are connected to these waters. The many ways harmful chemicals can pollute them. And what you could do to stop it. There are many well-known characters of this ecosystem that are able to move between the aquatic worlds. The ones within the Bredore and between the Bredore and surrounding oceans. I think the Atlantic salmon is a good representative of this kind of aquatic diplomacy. Plamu and Mi'kmaq. They're born in fresh water, such as the Bredore's Middle River. As young salmon, we call them a smolt. Eventually, they make their way into the saltier estuary and then out into the Atlantic Ocean, where they spend most of their life as adults, and then one day return to those rivers and start a salmon life cycle all over again. What a way to live! Scientists have taken to calling salmon and other kinds of fish with this lifestyle anadromous. Sounds kind of out of this world, eh? In direct opposition to this way of life, fish such as the American eel or katak in Mi'kmaq. This distinct and sacred animal is called a catadromus fish. Seriously, I'd love to be at the meeting when these names were thought of. But anyways. This name is used to classify fish who are born at sea and then travel into freshwater areas, such as in the Bredore, to live as adults. So this estuary supports all kinds of animals with some very interesting ways of living, reproducing, and just getting around. So who else is getting around in the estuary? 
The Bredore supports over 70 different species of fish. They're a notable and important member of any aquatic ecosystem. Some of the most common fish species found in the Bredore are the winter flounder, cod, and the American place. Getting around on the bottom, invertebrate animals such as the American lobster, the rock crab, and sea stars might be familiar to you. But what about their kids? Their weird, wonderful, and often microscopic offspring are temporary members of what we call the zooplankton. They float around up in the water column, pretty much going wherever the water takes them. Eventually, they settle down on the bottom and populate new habitats. Now these bristly worms are called polychaetes. They might not seem familiar at first, but they're diverse, numerous, and on and in the estuary bottom, they kind of fill a role similar to that of your friendly neighborhood earthworm. Now these bivalves, including the oyster, sea scallops, and blue mussels, might spend a lot of their time stuck to one spot or another, but as kids, they got around the same way as those other mobile invertebrates. Tiny crustaceans called copepods are on the larger scale and permanent members of the zooplankton club. They're diverse, and along with krill, they probably make up more biomass than any other animal on Earth. Beauty is definitely more than meets the naked eye when it comes to these microscopic creatures. The foraminifera. Over 39 species have been identified in the Bredore. Foraminifera are among the most abundant shelled organisms in many marine environments. Their shells are an important component of the sediment. Last, but definitely not least, the phytoplankton. These tiny floating algae, each no bigger than a pinhead, multiply with amazing speed and they produce more annual growth than all the land plants put together. Now will be a good time for me to move from the water to dry land. So how about a joke to distract you while I switch the stage from an aquatic to terrestrial setting? So why did the fish climb a tree? Give up? It didn't. Fish can't climb trees. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't invest too much into the hopes of a future as a scientific comedian, but I wasn't trying to trick you. Honest. So at first glance, it's difficult to connect fish, such as salmon, to trees. But they are connected. Since salmon aren't able to get to trees, the trees come to them. Or at least their shadows do. Earthlings of both the land and the water like to hang out in the shade of a tree. Shade helps to keep the water temperatures cool and moderate, and in the shade, Salmon can spawn and hide from predators. Plus, the root systems of these riverbank trees hold together and stabilize the soil, improving river habitats for all kinds of life by reducing soil erosion and siltation. And parts of the trees which fall into the rivers provide nutrients for the food webs from the ground up. But what about what salmon do for trees? While salmon who return to the rivers of the Bredore might not have a mass die-off like other kinds of salmon, such as the Pacific salmon, they do reproduce in large numbers for a reason. Their babies are pretty defenseless against predators. Those salmon eaters have to poop eventually, or die themselves. And when they do, there's a good chance it'll be in a place where their bodies will break down into the soil, and their nutrients released to be used by trees and all kinds of plants and other life. There's a lot of forest habitat in this ecosystem overall. There's forestry going on, there's no secrets there. That would be humans take part of the relationship that we have with trees. But when it comes to trees, it's a little easier to give back, I'd say. In our biosphere reserve, sugar maple, red maple, yellow birch, black ash, they're just some of the native trees that get replanted by volunteers and natural resource people in the biosphere reserve. There are many natural features of the biosphere reserve's land habitats. They tell stories of their own. In this biosphere reserve, the habitats are different, but connected by metaphorical echoes and overlaps between the ending of one place and the beginning of the next. What land habitats stand out to me? A combination of water, land, and organisms that often rely on both to live. A diversity of life and a filtering mechanism for water runoff entering the estuary are just some of the qualities of these ecosystems. An animal connected to and dependent on these places is the frog, or scolch in Mi'kmaq. Amphibian is a scientific term for frogs, and in fact it means two lives. They're good 
indicators of an ecosystem's health, and they're totally adorable. I've also learned a lot about some of the plants that inhabit these places. Plants that are culturally and medicinally important to Mi'kmaq people. Now there's some creatures living in the Rador Biosphere Reserve that you're not likely to see a lot of. They're at risk in Unamagi. They need their space and our respect. The Rador's coastal habitats say a lot of things. Do you know what the tides say to these places? I mean, if the extent of the water's advance and retreat upon the land was equated to words, they wouldn't be saying a whole lot. Tidal amplitude is what we call this back and forth water movement. The small tidal amplitude of the Bredor is unique and has many impacts on the entire Bredor ecosystem. Small tides means less exposed mudflats and less space for what are called intertidal zone ecosystems. However, the eelgrass beds that exist in these areas are some important spawning places for herring, a fish that was exhausted in the Bredor in the late 90s due to overfishing. Now moving on to, and into, all that is human in the Biosphere Reserve. And what we could do to add to the Bredor story. A pretty good way to add to the story of the Bredor would be through the creation of a marine science center. In fact, they already have one planned out. Who wouldn't want a field trip to a place called the House of the Sea? As a forward-thinking Biosphere Reserve, that's getting even better at drawing from the knowledge and lessons from the past, Connection to the people outside of the Biosphere Reserve is important too. My experience with these kind of outside connections in the Bredor would be working with the OTN project, the Ocean Tracking Network. In the Bredor Biosphere Reserve, scientists from CBU and other universities, and natural resource groups from many communities in Cape Breton, help out with one of the OTN's many fish and marine animal tagging projects. This global project is concerned with global warming. When pieced together, the knowledge gained about the movements of many different marine animals could help answer the many questions we have regarding the warmer and uncertain future of our world's oceans. And the future of all life depends on the oceans. A Biosphere Reserve is designated as such because its people have shown that they're supporting, promoting, and improving the many ways that humans live with nature. Keeping with the idea of evolution, one of the many important themes in life and in my story. I want you to think about a 12-hour clock. Now imagine all 3.4 billion years, approximately, of life's history on Earth was compressed into those 12 hours. Humans wouldn't show up until a couple seconds before midnight. We're pretty late to this show, I'd say. We might not own this show, but we're pretty good at hogging the stage. So I mean it when I say we're a relatively young species. I'm not lying, I swear to Darwin. Over time, every human society evolved very different cultures. Cultures produce different understandings of a people's place on Earth and in the cosmos. The collective knowledge, beliefs, language, and songs of a culture make up what's called a worldview. In every worldview, there was an understanding that everything is connected to everything else that nothing exists in isolation. People have always understood that we are deeply embedded and dependent upon our natural world. This idea is still promoted in modern cultures, but in some more than others. As a Biosphere Reserve, we're working towards re-remembering this worldview. It's important to our very existence on this planet. In a modern day capitalist society such as our own, it's not easy to grasp the idea that there are reasons beyond our own interest as to why each of us shouldn't use more and more from our ecosystem while leaving less and less behind for the future of all life. Just as our species' existence in relation to the history of life is relatively new, so is an environmental conscience in a post-industrial revolution world. A very important thought child of this movement is what we call sustainability. It's likely you've heard about this idea before, it's thrown around a lot these days, but there might be a bit of I don't think that means what you think it means going on here. In the broadest explanation, 
What sustainability really means is a capacity to endure. But in ecology, the world describes how biological systems remain diverse and productive over time. To be a truly ecologically promoting concept, sustainability needs a baseline ideal of striving to live in a way that promotes human activity, but is mindful of our relationships in and pressures upon the ecosystem. Sustainability really is something that requires a specific environmental context and specific capacities of the different humans in different nations. In some cultures, the baseline mentality driving sustainability has to be re-remembered. In other cultures, the idea has persisted in at least a good deal of people. But always remember there is diversity within cultures, as well as between them. Netigalimk is a Mi'kmaq word for an idea that has sustainability throughout it. Acting upon this concept in everyday life involves utilizing the bounty provided by our Mother Earth, achieving adequate standards of community, nutrition, health, and economic well-being without jeopardizing the integrity, diversity, or productivity of that ecosystem. Labrador Lake Ecosystem, as a biosphere reserve, is a step in the best direction to discover and support the story of all life and places within this ecosystem. You're never done learning as long as you're living, especially if science is your living. And science is pretty awesome. I'm not just saying that. It's been scientifically proven. Science always has room for new applicants if you're interested. That doesn't mean that everyone should be scientists. What a boring world that would be. There are multiple ways of living, exploring, and expressing ourselves in the natural world. They all add up to give a fuller picture of reality. Stories teach us. They help us to remember. It's important that you know that not knowing is very different from not caring. We're standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, while at the same time, we build upon and reinforce each other in the present. In his book, A Dream of the Earth, Earth scholar Thomas Berry wrote about our natural world as being both subject and object. It is the largest sacred community to which all life on this planet belongs. The Bredore is both a wondrous and yet very undiscovered place, with many parts of its story not yet written. Our new title as a Biosphere Reserve is the result of an island's health, beauty, and its people's want to embrace and strive towards living with the natural world and all its elements, for the benefit and betterment of all life and places on Earth. In the beauty, mystery, and wonder that our brain perceives and expresses, we do add many gifts to this planet. Stories are a big part of them. Stories teach us that to become alienated from the rest of our community is to become destitute in all that makes us human. So tell me a story. The story that brings us together. The human community with every living being, anywhere from the highest mountain to the lowest of ocean floors.